Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Math 321. Today we're going to continue Investigation 30, which is homomorphisms and isomorphism theorems. So here are a couple of things from last time that are going to be important today. Definition 30.2, let G and H be groups. A function phi from G to H is a homomorphism of groups if and only if phi of A times B equals phi of A times phi of B for all A, B, and G. So I think the reason they call this a homomorphism of groups is because there is actually also a thing called a homomorphism of rings, which is different. Rings are another thing that we could have studied in this class, but we didn't. So then there are some different types of homomorphisms. A monomorphism is an injective homomorphism, an epimorphism is a surjective homomorphism, and then of course an isomorphism is a bijective homomorphism. And then if we do have an epimorphism phi from g to g prime, so a surjective homomorphism uh, onto g prime, we call g prime the homomorphic image of g. Okay, so let's get started with some properties of homomorphisms. So in the last investigation, we showed that every isomorphism between uh, two groups G and H maps the identity in G to the identity in H. And we also saw that isomorphisms map inverses to inverses. And these things are also true of homomorphisms. So we have a theorem here that tells us that. Theorem 30.4, let G and H be groups with identities EG and EH respectively, and let phi from G to H be a homomorphism. Then uh, one, the image of uh, the identity in G under phi is going to be E of H, or the identity in H. And then if A is an element of G, then phi of A inverse is phi of A, and then that's in parentheses uh, inverse. So those are two important properties that we'll need today. Okay, let's just look at a brief proof of that theorem right there. So let G and H be groups with identities EG and EH respectively, and let phi from G to H be a homomorphism. Okay, then what we can do is we can say phi of EG times phi of EG is equal to, we'll put the two EGs together in parentheses like that. That's the uh, homomorphism property right there. And then EG times EG, of course, is just EG, so we get that. And then what we can do right here is we can actually introduce um, EH right there because phi of EG is an element of, G8, uh, sorry, of H. Uh, so you can multiply by the identity in H whenever you want to. Uh, so we can do that. And then um, what we can do is if we start from this point right here and we go to this point right here, that equation of those two things, we can cancel phi of EG from that. And that'll show us that phi of EG equals EH. And now for the second part, um, let A be an element of G. So we want to show this thing right here. And what we can do is pretty clever, actually. So we note that EH equals phi of EG. And then we can rewrite phi of EG like this as A times A inverse. And then we can split that into two um, separate parts there. And then that tells us that if we look from the beginning to the end of that equation right here, EH equals phi of A times phi of A inverse. That means that phi of A and phi of A inverse must be each other's inverses. Uh, so that tells us this last part right here. Okay. All right, so now let's talk about the concept of the kernel of a homomorphism. This is a surprisingly kind of important and useful thing. So let phi from G to H be a homomorphism of groups. We know that phi maps the identity in G to the identity in H. And then if phi is a monomorphism, in other words, if it is injective, then phi maps only the identity to the identity. Okay, because injective maps, um, every uh, input has its own different output. However, um, a lot of the times these homomorphisms are not monomorphisms. So if phi is not injective, then there might be quite a few other things that are also being mapped to the identity. So that brings us to this definition here, definition 30.5. Let phi from G to H be a homomorphism of groups, and let EH be the identity in H. The kernel of phi is the set, uh, it's denoted like this, kernel of phi, and that is simply equal to all of the elements in G that are mapped to the identity in H under the phi map. So that's called the kernel. And uh, you may have actually seen something that is similar to this uh, back when you took linear algebra. So um, in linear algebra, the set of objects that are sent to the zero vector under a matrix transformation is called the null space of a matrix. And this is uh, kind of a similar idea to that. And so you might remember that the null space was kind of important and uh, kernels are also important. 
Okay, so let's do a quick activity here um, to find some kernels. So these are uh, part A through D here are from activity 30.3. These are the ones that actually did turn out to be homomorphisms in that activity. So these are all homomorphisms. So go ahead and find the kernel for each of these. Pause the video, try that, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so let's go ahead and go over this. So we're trying to find all of the things here that are in G that are mapped by phi um, to the identity in H. So the identity in H, so both of these groups here are additive. So the identity in H is zero, or the uh, congruence class of zero. Um, so what gets mapped, um, what are the X's in the integers um, such that uh, phi of x equals 0 in um, mod modulus 5. So this is the question that we're trying to answer here. Um, so if you think about this, uh, 0 mod 5 is also um, 5 mod 5, and it's also 10 mod 5, and so on and so forth. Um, you can do the negative ones as well. Um, Etc. So the kernel here is going to be just all the multiples of 5. Okay. So this will be all the x's in the integers um, such that x uh, is a multiple of 5. I could probably say that more elegantly, but I'll just write it like that. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's look at part b here. So g is only three elements, so this we could actually just check by hand. Um, what are the things that are being mapped to 0? So let's just check. Uh, let's see, what is phi of 0 mod 3? That's going to be, um, well, that'll be 0. Okay, so that'll be in the kernel. Um, and then phi of 1 mod 3. So that's going to be 6, so that's not in the kernel. And then phi of 2 mod 3. Uh, that is going to be 12, so that's not in the kernel. So the kernel here is just uh, 0. Okay, let's look at part C here. So um, our domain is the integers again, so we have to think about this kind of carefully. So what is the identity in H? So the identity in H is... 0 mod 2 comma 0 mod 4 because these are both additive groups okay so it's not 1 it's 0 and then we have to think about um, what are the integers we could put in that would give us 0 for both of those places so certainly all of the even numbers would give you 0 in the first place but they would not necessarily all give you 0 for um, the second part so we're going to need all the multiples of 4 I think that will do it that'll give us 0 in both places um, so this kernel is going to be, uh, let's just call it, well, we can do it like this. Um, if I write the multiples of 4 like this, uh, 4x, such that x is an integer. It's a little more elegant way of writing it. So multiples of 4. Okay, and then the last one, uh, we're going from the positive reals to the positive reals. So these are multiplicative groups. Our operation is multiplication. And then we want to know um, what is k such that um, square root of k equals 1. So obviously there's only one k that's going to work like that, uh, and that's just 1. So this kernel will just be the element uh, 1. And that's it. Okay, so now let's do another activity where we're going to look at whether the kernel is actually a subgroup of G. So let G and H be groups with identities EG and EH respectively, and let phi from G to H be a homomorphism. Go ahead and pause the video and try to answer these questions, and then we'll go over them. Okay, so let's go ahead and go over these. I'm going to try to squish these all on one side, because I don't think they're very complicated. Uh, so first of all, is EG in the kernel of phi? So we know, or we showed and proved earlier that um, phi of eg equals eh. Uh, so yes, it is in the kernel. It gets mapped to the identity in h. Okay, second one is the kernel of phi closed under the operation in g. 
So to figure this out, we need to take two things that are in the kernel and then multiply them together and then see if they're still in the kernel. So let's take two things that are in the kernel. So let's say let a, b be elements of g such that um, a and b are in the kernel of phi. Okay, so that means what do we then know about um, a and b? Well, we know that phi of a equals phi of b equals e h. So they both get mapped to the identity. So then what happens to a b? Where does it get mapped to? So then phi of a b will be, so remember phi is a homomorphism, so we can split this like this. And then that's going to be e h times e h, which is just going to be e h. So that means a b is in the kernel as well. Okay, and then the third one here, if a is in the kernel of phi, is a inverse in the kernel of phi? Okay, let's think about this. Um, so if a is in the kernel of phi, then phi of a equals e h. Okay, remember we showed before um, that phi of a inverse is equal to, you can do it like this, phi of a, and then raise that to the negative one. Okay, so that is just going to be e h to the negative one, and of course e h inverse is just e h again. Um, so this proves that a inverse is indeed in the kernel of phi, because it also gets mapped to the identity in h. Okay, and then so part d, um, is kernel of phi a subgroup of g? Uh, well, we showed that it has the identity. Uh, we showed that it's closed. And we showed that it has inverses. So yeah, it is a subgroup of G, surprisingly. Uh, it is. Okay, so now that we've shown that the kernel of phi is a normal sub, uh, sorry, is a subgroup of G, um, here we have a theorem that tells us it is actually a normal subgroup of G. So theorem 30.8. Let h, uh, sorry, let g and h be groups, and let phi from g to h be a group homomorphism, then the kernel of phi is a normal subgroup of g. So the proof here is just going to address the normal part, because we've already proved um, that it's a subgroup of g. So let's look at the proof. Let g and h be groups, and let phi from g to h be a group homomorphism. Let eg and eh be the identities for g and h respectively, and let k equal the kernel of phi. So we're just using k um, instead of kernel of phi to just save space there. Uh, to show that k is a normal subgroup of g, we will show that a k a inverse is a subset of k for all a and g. I hope you remember um, we had a theorem previously that showed us that was a sufficient condition for k to be a normal subgroup. Okay, so let x be an element of a k a inverse. So now we want to show, of course, that x is going to be an element of k as well. Okay, then x is equal to a little k, a inverse, for some a uh, in g and some little k in big k. Then phi of k has to equal e of e h. Remember, because k is an element of the kernel, so that's going to be true. Okay, so then we can simplify phi of x in the following manner. So we just write x as a k a inverse, and then we split these up like that because phi is a homomorphism. All right, and then we simplify them each separately, so we get e h from phi of k because k is in the kernel. And then uh, we learned that we can do this simplification right there in the previous theorem. Okay, and then we just keep simplifying and we get e h. So that means that x is also in the kernel. And so that tells us that a k uh, a inverse is a subset of k. And so that means that the kernel is a normal subgroup. Okay, so now that we've discussed the kernel of a homomorphism, let's talk about the image of a homomorphism. And we're going to see that the kernel and the image are actually related in quite an interesting way. So let phi from g to h be a homomorphism. If phi is an epimorphism, remember that means it's uh, surjective, then every element of h is the image under phi of some element from g. However, if phi is not an epimorphism, then some elements of h are missed by phi. So the phi never outputs them. So that brings us to this next definition here, definition 30.9. Let phi from g to h be a homomorphism of groups. The image of phi is the set, uh, we have this notation for it, just read that as the image of phi. So it's just simply the output that we get from phi for every element in g. So it's exactly what you um, would think that it would be. It's the image 
of uh, the entire group under that uh, map. Okay, so go ahead and try this activity here. Pause the video and try this, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so let's go ahead and go over this. So we're going to find the image of five for each of these different five maps, and these are all homomorphisms. All right, so part A, uh, we're looking at the domain of the integers, and the codomain is uh, Z5. And then our phi map is pretty simple. We just map each integer to its congruence class. Uh, so the image here, I think, is going to be all of Z5. Um, so I'm just going to write that, and then I'll kind of explain why. So the image is going to be Z5 because, um, for example, um, one maps to one, and then two maps to two, and then three maps to three. So we get all of these as, as outputs. Just using this little arrow notation is kind of like a shorthand, and then five goes to zero, or we could have started with zero, I guess. Uh, so we do get the entire uh, codomain there. All right, let's look at the second one. So I think this is uh, not going to happen in the second one, right? Because we've plugged these in a few times here. Um, so when we plug in zero, we get zero. So zero mod three, then we get zero mod 18. Uh, when we plug in one mod three, we get six mod 18. And then when we plug in two mod three, we get uh, 12 mod 18. So that is actually not um, the whole codomain. So the image here is just zero, six, and 12. Okay. All right, let's look at part C. Uh, I think we had plugged in a few from this previously as well, but let's go ahead and give a try plugging in a few things. Um, so let's see, if I plug in um, zero, then I'm gonna get zero, zero. And if I plug in one, I'm gonna get one, one. If I plug in two, so now it starts to circle back on itself because I'm going to get zero again there for the first one, and then I'll get two for the second one. And then if I plug in three, I'm going to get one here, and then I'm going to get three here, and I believe this is um, all of them. So okay, actually this this does go through. Wait a minute. No, this doesn't go through the entire um, codomain because. We never get um, one comma two, for example. I don't think we can get that if we just go if we start doing the next ones. Sorry, my cats are fighting in the background. <laughs> um, so we're gonna get zero again, and then we'll get um, so this will be zero again, and then it's just gonna keep going on uh, like that. Like for example, if I try to do five, it's just gonna take me to one one again. I think um, so. Let's see, five mod two is one, and then five mod four is uh, also one. Um, so you see these are actually, like, those are the same, those are the same. So it, it starts uh, repeating itself. So this codomain has eight elements, but we only got um, uh, four of them. Do I have to write these all again? Can I just kind of circle this and put that there? <laughs> okay, let's look at part D. Um, so the codomain is the uh, positive reals, domain is positive reals. And then I do believe that we are actually going to hit, um, oops. I said this wrong, didn't I? Not the kernel, it's the image. Uh, so I believe the image here is going to be uh, all of the positive reals um, for the simple reason that every positive real is the square root of something. Another positive real. Okay, so I believe that map is actually um, onto or surjective. All right, so now that we've done that, let's talk about uh, whether the image of a homomorphism is indeed another subgroup. So this time it'll be a subgroup of H, of course, rather than G. So go ahead and uh, pause the video and try this activity, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so I'm going to try to squish this all on one slide again. So first of all, is EH in the image of phi? So this is definitely um, a yes, and that is because um, phi of EG will be EH. So we are definitely going to hit EH with the phi function. Okay, second one, is the image of phi closed under the operation in H? 
So to figure this out, we need to take two elements that are in the image and then show that their product is also in the image. So this is like uh, slightly more complicated than the version for the kernel, but uh, it's not too bad. So let's let um, h1 and h2 be in the image of phi. I'm just going to call them h's because they're in h. Um, okay, so since they're in the image of phi, that means there exist uh, g1 and g2, which are in g, such that uh, phi of g1 equals h1, and phi of g2 equals h2. Okay, so now let's think about um, what would give us h1 times h2. Is there an element in g we can plug in that'll give us h1 times h2? I think it's not too hard to think of, right? So then if we do phi of g1, g2, like this, so that's an element in g, right? Then what do we get? We get phi of g1, so we can split this, phi of g2, and that is h1, h2. So g1, g2, when you plug that in, it gives you h1, h2. So h1, h2 is an element of the image. It is in the image of phi. Okay. All right, part C, if y is in the image of phi, is y inverse in the image of phi? Okay, let's think about this. So if y is in the image of phi, then there exists some, let's say, x in g, such that phi of x equals y. Okay, so now we have to think of an element in g that we could plug in that would give us y inverse, and it's not too hard to think of, right? So then if we plug in x inverse, that's going to be, we can take the inverse to the outside like this. And then that's going to be um, y inverse. So y inverse will be in the image of phi. Oops. Okay, and then part D is the image of phi, a subgroup of H. So we showed that um, it has the identity. We showed that it's closed. And we showed that it has inverses. So yes, it is. OK, so now we're going to talk about the isomorphism theorems for groups. So these are four really important uh, theorems. Um, so sometimes homomorphisms can be used to recognize isomorphic groups, even if the homomorphisms themselves are not isomorphisms. And there are four theorems, which are called the isomorphism theorems for groups, which formalize this idea. So we're going to go through all four of them and do some activities and prove them all. Uh, I think we'll get through um, one or maybe two of them today, and then we'll do the rest next time. Okay, so here's a preview activity, preview activity 30.12, that's going to give us the basic idea of the first isomorphism theorem. So go ahead and pause the video and try this activity, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so let's go ahead and go over this. So let G be Z24, H be Z8, and then phi from G to H is defined by um, the image of M in Z24 is going to be 6M in Z8. So first of all, we need to show that phi is well-defined, and why is this necessary? So um, I'll answer the why is it necessary part first. So this is necessary so that um, phi behaves in a predictable manner and is in fact a function. Um, so things that are not well-defined are not actually functions. So uh, we need to show, how are we going to show this? So we need to show that if um, m24, so if we basically, if we have the same input, but it looks differently, because we're in z24, so inputs can look differently, like 0 is the same as 24, for example. Um, so if m24 equals n24, then they need to give us the same output. So we need that 6m mod 8 would be the same as uh, 6n mod 8. I hope that makes sense to you. Okay, so let's say we let uh, m24 equal 
well, let's say first, first of all that they're both uh, elements of Z24. So let these two be elements of Z24 such that they are equal. Okay, so now let's compare what um, 6m mod 8 and 6n mod 8 would be. And let's use what we know from this uh, assumption that we've just made here, that, that m and n are the same in Z24. So this would mean that um, m is congruent, or m is equivalent or equal to n uh, mod 24, like this. So that means that 24 divides m minus n. So um, if 24 divides m minus n, then that means that m minus n is a multiple of 24. So we can say that it equals 24k for some k integer. Okay, then let's go ahead and multiply this equation by 6, and I'll show you where that gets us. Um, so then 6m minus 6n is going to be equal to 6 times 24k. Um, and can we factor an 8 out of that? So I think we can, right? This will be 8 times 6 times 3 times k. So 8 divides 6m minus 6n. So that means that 6m is congruent to 6n mod 8. So that means that 6m mod 8 equals 6n mod 8. Okay. So this shows us that the function is indeed well-defined. If we plug in uh, two elements that look different but that are actually the same, uh, we get the same output. Okay, let's look at part B. Show that phi is a homomorphism of groups and then determine whether it's a monomorphism, epimorphism, or isomorphism. Okay, so to show that it is a, a homomorphism, we're going to take two elements in G. So let's let uh, M24 and N24 be in Z24. Okay, and now our homomorphism equation is going to use addition because these uh, G and H are both additive groups. Okay, so let's try plugging in um, M24 plus N24, like this. Okay, and then we get, uh, so I can squish those both together in the same square brackets. I like to call it squishing because that's fun. All right, and then this is just going to be, uh, it's going to be six times m plus n mod 8. That's how the map works. And then I can split that back out, right? Uh, I can do it like this. So 6m mod 8 plus 6n mod 8. And then that is actually phi of uh, m24 uh, plus phi of n mod 24. Okay, so uh, phi is a homomorphism. Okay, now is it a, a monomorphism, an epimorphism, or an isomorphism? Um, so it certainly cannot be a monomorphism for the simple reason that G is larger than H. So I'll just write that. So this cannot be injective because uh, G is larger than H. And uh, furthermore, it actually can't be surjective either uh, for the following reason. So when you're multiplying by 6, you're making all the elements even, right? So you're never going to hit like 7 mod 8 or 5 mod 8. Um, 6m is even for all integers m. So we never hit we never reach uh, 5 mod 8, for example. Um, so certainly it is not um, a monomorphism, it's not an epimorphism, and then of course it's not an isomorphism either. Okay, let's look at part C. So we just want to find all the elements in the kernel. So we want to find the elements that are being mapped to 0 mod 8. So the kernel in 
uh, sorry, the identity in H. We need to identify that first. Uh, so that's obviously zero, um, but we need to expand on that a little bit. So zero mod eight is actually, um, so that's all the things that are congruent to zero mod eight, right? Like uh, negative eight, zero, eight, 16, um, 24, and so on. Okay, so what are the things, uh, what are the values of M that we could plug in that would give us those? So what M in Z have six M equal to a multiple of eight is the question. So if you want six M to be a multiple of eight, six already has a factor of two in it, but that it only has one factor of two. So you're going to need the other two factors of two to come from M itself. Uh, so let's write that. So we need um, four to divide M. Okay. So the kernel of phi then is going to be all the multiples of four. So that is going to be uh, zero and then four, and then eight, uh, 12, 16, and then 20, and then 24, of course, is zero. So we don't need that one that's already in there. Okay, so that's our kernel. Okay, so let's look at part D here. Determine the elements of the group G mod K. So remember G mod K, that's just the set of cosets of K. And so here I've pasted K from the last slide. So that's the first one. And then um, remember this is an additive group, so we're not going to be doing elements times K, we're going to be doing elements plus K. All right, so what is something that's not in K? Uh, the first thing is one, right? So we can add one to K to get a coset. And so that is going to be uh, one, I'm just going to write them without the subscripts, um, if you guys don't mind. Uh, so this will be 1, and then 5, and then uh, 9, and then 13, and then 17, and then 21. Okay, and those are all sub uh, 24. And then if we do 2, that's the next one that's not in either of those. Um, that'll be 2, and then 6, uh, 10, 14, 18, and 22. And then we need, uh, we haven't done three yet, so let's do three. So that'll be three, and then seven, and then 11, and then 15, 19, and 23. Okay, and at this point we have covered um, all of the elements of Z24, uh, so we've partitioned Z24 with these four cosets, so that is all of them. Uh, so G mod K just has these four elements here. So let's think about whether this is um, abelian or cyclic. I'll just kind of make some more room over here. So it is going to be abelian, and basically it's because G itself is abelian, um, but we can show that it's abelian. Um, for example, if we have um, a plus k times um, b plus k, or sorry, we wouldn't be multiplying them, we'd be adding them, right? <laughs> sorry, because um, this is an additive group, um, then that is the same as um, a plus b plus k, and then we can reverse the order um, because addition is abelian like that, and so that's uh, B plus K plus A plus K. Okay, and then is it um, cyclic? So it is actually cyclic, um, and I'll show you that you can generate it. Um, so G um, mod K is actually generated by um, 1 sub 24 plus K. Um, so remember that will be all of the uh, integer multiples, um, maybe I'll call it n. Um, so this is the integer multiples, because this is an additive group, we do integer multiples instead of integer powers, um, where n is in c. 
Um, so you do actually get all of them. Um, when n is 1, you get uh, 1 plus k, and then when n is 2, you get 2 plus k, and then when n is 3, you get uh, 3 plus k, and uh, when n is 4, you get um, just k itself. Uh, so yeah, it is cyclic. Okay, so let's do part E. Uh, let r equal the image of phi, find all the elements of r. Okay, so let's just start uh, plugging stuff into this phi function and see what we get. So if I plug in 0 mod 24, I get uh, 0 mod 8. And then if I plug in 1 mod 24, so I'm multiplying that by 6, so I get 6 mod 8. If I plug in 2 mod 24, uh, I get um, 12 mod 8, but 12 mod 8 is equal to 4 mod 8. Okay, if I plug in 3 mod 24, I get um, 3 times 6 is uh, 18. And then that's mod 8, so that's going to be 2 mod 8. And at this point, I've gotten all of the even numbers in um, z mod 8. And I know I can only get even numbers from doing this because I'm multiplying by 6. Uh, so this is just going to be these four uh, elements here. So 0, 6, um, 4, and 2. So it's just all of the even numbers there. All right, and let's look at part F here. What specific relationship is there between the groups G mod K and R? Explain. So we found that the group um, G mod K was actually a cyclic group generated by uh, 1 mod 24 plus K. Um, it had uh, four elements and it was abelian. And what was R? So R was this uh, set right here, so it was 0 mod 8, uh, 2 mod 8, 4 mod 8, and 6 mod 8, so all the evens. Um, so that is also a cyclic group which is generated by um, 2. And um, it does have also 4 elements, and it's abelian. So, hmm, it's kind of interesting. They look, uh, like, they look different, but they are quite similar. And in fact, we're going to see that they are um, isomorphic. Okay, so what we saw at the end of that activity there is going to be formalized by this theorem right here, the first isomorphism theorem. Let G and H be groups, and let phi from G to H be a group homomorphism. Then G mod the kernel of phi is isomorphic to the image of phi. And the proof of this theorem is going to be in the next activity. So this is a pretty cool um, theorem, like it's it's really kind of unexpected. Um, but when you take the cosets of the kernel of a homomorphism, uh, those cosets will indeed be isomorphic to the image of the homomorphism. It's kind of unexpectedly a uh, cool result. So let's look at the proof in the next activity. Okay, so here is the activity where we're going to prove um, the first isomorphism theorem. So go ahead and pause the video and give this a try, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so let's go over this. Let G and H be groups, and let phi from G to H be a group homomorphism. For the sake of convenience, let K equal kernel of phi. So we're just going to call it K for short. Uh, we have already seen that K equals kernel of phi is a normal subgroup of G, so G mod K is a group. To prove theorem 30.13, we first need to define a function from G mod K to H. So we're trying to show that um, G mod K is isomorphic to the image of phi, and the image of phi, of course, is a subgroup of H, so we're going to need an isomorphism uh, to go from G mod K to um, at least part of H, so we're just going to have a function from G mod K to H. Um, a natural choice for such a function is capital phi, so capital phi goes from G mod K to H and is defined by capital phi of the coset AK is just going to be little phi of A for all of the cosets AK in G mod K. Okay, so this is going to be the um, capital phi is going to provide our isomorphism. So we need to prove a few things about it to show that it um, is an isomorphism. First of all, we need to prove that capital phi is well defined. Uh, so why do we need to do this? I feel like I've answered this question a million times, so maybe I'll just skip it this time. But um, you can't show that something is an isomorphism unless it is a well-defined function. In fact, it's not even a function unless it's well-defined. Uh, but let's go ahead and show this, um, because it's definitely not so obvious in this case, because cosets can be represented in many different ways. Um, so it doesn't go without saying that this is well-defined. We do actually need to show it. Okay. Um, 
So let's do that. So suppose uh, we have two elements in our domain. So I'm going to call the elements, uh, they're, in, they're going to be cosets. So let's say AK and BK are in uh, G mod K. So these are cosets of K. And suppose that they are the same coset, but they're just being represented by uh, two different elements. Remember, you can represent a coset by any element that is in the coset. So anything that's in AK could be used to, to make B. Okay, um, so we need to show, we will show, oops, my pen is messing up. Uh, we will show that capital Phi of AK equals capital Phi. Oops, I forgot how to write a capital Phi. <laughs> Um, of BK. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Uh, let's see. So I think we're going to need to use the fact that um, AK equals BK. So let's see, let me try to do it like this. Um, okay, so since AK equals BK, um, that means that um, B is in AK. It's in that coset. Um, so there is some element in K, uh, which I guess I'll call little k for lack of a better idea. Um, so there's some little k in big K such that uh, B equals A times little k. Okay, um, then we can say the following. Uh, then phi of B is going to be phi of a times little k, and then this is a homomorphism, so we can break it up uh, like this. And then k is in the kernel. Remember, k big k is the kernel. Uh, so this is going to be phi of a times e. Um, what are we calling the identity? I'm just going to call it e, I guess. Let me just make a little note there. That's the identity. Um, so this is going to be phi of a. So, okay, so phi of a equals phi of b. So that means that. Um, since phi of a equals phi of b, remember those are the outputs from the capital phi function as well. So that means that um, capital phi of a k big K equals uh, capital phi of b k. Okay, I think that makes sense. I hope you agree. Okay, so now let's prove that this capital phi thing is a homomorphism of groups. All right, so we need to take uh, two things that are in the domain of capital Phi and then prove that they satisfy that homomorphism property. All right, so let's take two cosets in G mod K. I'm going to say let AK and BK be in uh, G mod K. All right, then what happens if I plug them together into the capital Phi function multiplied together? So we'll do it like this. All right, let's see if I can simplify this. So first of all, how do you multiply two cosets together? So you just multiply their representative elements together like this, and then put the k again. All right, and then uh, this is defined to be little phi of ab. All right, that's how capital phi is defined. And then little phi we know is a homomorphism. Okay, so we can break up little phi like this. All right, and then now I want to try to build this back up to um, capital phi with a k and a b, right? So this is going to be uh, capital Phi of uh, a k, and the second one is going to be capital Phi of b k. Okay, so I showed the homomorphism property for capital Phi. All right, part c, prove that Phi is a monomorphism. In other words, that it is injective. All right, so how do you prove that a function is injective? Uh, you take two elements in the domain, and you assume that they give the same output, and then you show that they must have been the same element. Okay, so let's select two elements from the domain. So again, I'm just going to let these be a k and b k, and these are going to be in the domain, which is g mod k. All right, and we suppose or assume that they give the same output in the capital Phi function. Okay, so we're assuming this. And then we're going to try to show that they must have been the same element. All right, so that's where we want to get to. All right, so let's use the fact that they gave the same output. So since capital Phi of AK equals capital Phi of BK, 
um, then uh, phi of a must equal phi of b, so that's how capital phi is defined. Um, okay, so at this point we have to be kind of careful because this does not necessarily imply that a equals b, and we don't need for a to actually equal b, all we need is that a k equals b k, so in other words that b um, is equal to an element of a k, or that a is equal to an element of b k. Um, so we do have to be a, a little bit um, a little bit careful here. So let me show you one way that you could do this. There might be some several ways that you could do it, but um, here's one way. Um, so since uh, phi of a equals phi of b, uh, I'm going to try to get those on the same side of the equation so I can try to do some kind of homomorphism stuff to them. Um, so this is going to imply I'm going to take and multiply both sides of the equation by the inverse of phi of b, like this. Okay, and then on the right-hand side, that's just going to leave me with um, EH, the identity... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, EH, the identity element in H. Right, because phi's are um, elements in H. Okay, and then uh, I can simplify this part that's on the left into phi of A times phi of B inverse, bring the inverse inside, like that. Okay, and then I can smoosh the two phi's together using the homomorphism property. So this tells me that AB inverse, um, phi of AB inverse is equal to EH. So this tells me that AB inverse is an element of the kernel, right? Because when I plug in AB inverse, I get um, EH. Okay, so AB inverse is in the kernel. All right, so that means that um, AB inverse equals K for some uh, element little k in the big K. Okay, and then that is going to tell me that A equals, so if I multiply on the right on both sides of that equation by B, then I get um, I get A equals uh, KB, so that tells me that A is in the coset KB, which is equal to BK, because K is a normal subgroup, uh, which we proved. So normal means you can swap things around the um, subgroup like that. KB and BK are the same thing. Left and right code sets are the same thing. Uh, so since A is an element of the coset BK, uh, this means that the coset AK is equal to the coset BK. Okay, I hope that argument makes sense to you guys. This was definitely the hardest part of the proof right here. Okay, so part D, prove that the image of capital phi is equal to the image of little phi. Uh, this is not very hard at all. I think I can just do this by a, like a set builder argument, basically. Um, so let's see, the image of capital phi is defined um, like this. So it is all of the outputs of this capital phi thing. Um, how should I call the elements? Um, so the cosets are like this. They are A, Ks, where A is some element of G, right? That's all the cosets. And then the image is just the outputs uh, when you plug those into the function, capital Phi. Okay, and then this is just going to be equal to, remember how that capital Phi function is defined? This is just simply Phi of uh, A for A and G. And that is simply, I mean, that is the image of little Phi. So yeah, it's like not a very hard argument at all. All right. And finally, part E, explain how the previous parts of this activity prove the fourth, first isomorphism theorem. Okay, so here's what we've proved so far. So we showed um, that capital Phi, which goes from G mod kernel of little phi to H, um, is a homomorphism. Well, actually we showed that it's an injective homomorphism, right? An injective homomorphism. Um, and then every uh, every map is surjective onto its image, so or onto its range, if you want to think about it that way. Everything is surjective onto its range. Um, okay, so that means that um, phi is a bijection, 
for a bijective homomorphism. Uh, from g mod kernel of phi, little phi, uh, to the image of capital phi. Okay, and then we showed uh, as well that uh, the image of capital phi is the same as the image of little phi. Okay, so um, capital phi um, from G mod kernel of little phi to the image of little phi is a bijective homomorphism. Homomorphism, um, which is just another way of saying that it's an isomorphism. Okay, bijective homomorphism is um, an isomorphism. So yay, we did it. Yay. <laughs> okay, so let's look at um, an important example of the first isomorphism theorem. And this is gonna recall something that I had actually pointed out previously. So let n be a positive integer. We know that the set n times z, where it's literally just n times all of the integers, uh, is a subgroup of z. So it's closed, it has inverses, it's associative, it has the identity. Um, it can be shown that the canonical map phi from z to zn defined by, you just take the um, congruence class of all the elements of z, uh, that is an epimorphism, so it does hit everything in uh, zn, and uh, the kernel of that map is in z. Okay, so all the things that would be mapped to zero would be the multiples of n, right? Um, so that means that if we do z mod the kernel of that map, which is in z, then we get the image of the map, which is zn. Okay, so that means that uh, by the first isomorphism theorem, uh, z mod nz is uh, isomorphic to zn. So that means that zn, it's really a quotient group of the integers. So that's quite interesting, and um, that is actually the origin of why we read the little slash mark there. We read that thing as mod, because it has to do with um, with zn. So zn is, uh, is uh, defined off of the modulo n relationship, and so that's where that uh, terminology comes from. All right, so we'll stop there for today and we'll do the rest of the isomorphism theorems next time. I'll see you later.